Hi, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me from back there? Does this work? Hi. My name is Jacopo. I'm here today to talk in general about how we, a little bit about how we work on uh, data and automation at the Dutch Red Cross. Um, but more specifically, I will present you one specific use case um, that uh, has to do with uh, Ukraine. So let's start with 510. That's the name of my team. It's the data and digital team of the Netherlands Red Cross. Our job, so the Red Cross, Red Crescent, important for those of you who are not humanitarians, we are a federated entity. So each country has their own Red Cross or Red Crescent society. And each, in each country, they basically oversee the programs and all the humanitarian support that they give. So we, as Dutch Red Cross, help local organizations to help local people. Okay, contrary to other organizations, we usually don't implement directly, but we support the local organization in doing this job more efficiently or, or better or, of course, also financially. Uh, our team specifically, we work on a few digital products and many data-related services. So, uh, yeah, in industry, you could say we are a bit like consultants for other national societies. Um, and the name, if you're wondering, comes from the surface of the Earth, 510 million square kilometers, where a data team, we, we work everywhere in the world. Yeah, that's the story. It's a bit nerd, but uh, that's where it comes from. Um, now, we work on five thematic areas, just to give you a bit of an overview of what my team does. Um, Anticipatory action, we call it. That's everything that we can do to predict the impact of future disasters, to uh, organize the work that Red Cross does to anticipate, to mitigate the impact of disasters. So, this early action uh, concerns things like everything that you can do before a disaster arrives. It can be a, a, you know, a hurricane or it can be an epidemic. Everything you can do beforehand to reduce the impact. Uh, and of course, in terms of data and digital, so information management. Uh, cash and voucher assistance, so we do digital tools and services to help the Red Cross digitalize all their cash-related processes. Probably you know, but in the humanitarian uh, world, there is a big push towards reducing the aid that we provide in kind through physical goods. And we try as much as possible to bring cash to people so that they can choose how they spend it and they can support the local economy even during a disaster. So we are trying to support that process by the proper digital infrastructure, basically. Community engagement and accountability, that has to do with, uh, that's a buzzword that we use to say communication. So everything has to do with communication with people affected during disasters, either to provide information about the services of the Red Cross or receiving requests for whatever, whatever they need help with. So we have a number of uh, products and services, again, on, on that domain. Emergency support. Well, you still have disasters, you still have requests that you cannot foresee, and that's when we do everything that we can do to support a national society. Everything does not fall under any other category and has to do with an emergency, we do. We send people during emergencies to support the local Red Cross. I have been in many places, most recently this year, in and out of Ukraine, um, and that's what we do as a team, support also where it's needed. Uh, and finally, water landscape, that's a bit of a new topic for us, but it has to do with water availability, especially in the context of climate change. Uh, water is becoming uh, less and less uh, accessible in big areas of the world, and how we can mitigate that uh, through proper um, solutions. Now, what, we're gonna, what I'm going to talk about today, as I mentioned before, is specifically about Ukraine. So, a snapshot about the Ukraine crisis, just in case you've been uh, living under the rock. Uh, about a year ago, there was, um, Ukraine was invaded by Russia. That led to more than 6 million people internally displaced. So, these are people within Ukraine that had to move elsewhere from where they were living, but they stayed in Ukraine. And as an equal number of people that moved abroad, so from Ukraine to the neighboring countries. Mostly, so living here, probably you've heard about the Netherlands, but actually most people, they, still, they are still in Poland and in the neighboring countries close to Ukraine. So that's where most of the aid in the neighboring countries is actually um, focused. And in total, we, they were estimated that half of the population of Ukraine, 21 million people, need help one way or the other because they don't have a job anymore, because they cannot access basic services, etc. So it's one of the biggest crises of, uh, that we had in Europe. Um, and uh, obviously the Red Cross movement is supporting Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian Red Cross in Ukraine and the local Red Crosses in all the neighboring countries. 
Just to give you a snapshot, this is the number of operations that we have uh, in the region and in the neighboring countries. These are the number of projects in different areas, health, uh, shelter, cash uh, distribution, education, food, uh, etc. So we cover a whole range of services uh, uh, for people affected uh, by the conflict, mostly in Ukraine, but as you see also elsewhere. That's it, snapshot of, um, of what's happening. Now, uh, what I'm going to talk about today has to do with uh, Telegram. So what we realized early during the conflict is that Ukrainian refugees started these self-help groups on Telegram and Viber after living within Ukraine, but also after leaving the country. So these self-help groups are big chats. I don't know if you use Telegram, but Telegram has this feature that you can have public groups and public channels. These are massive chats that everybody can join. All the messages are public and everybody can, can, can see them. You can join and contribute to the discussion. It's like a, yeah, a gigantic chat. Um, and in many countries, actually, Ukrainian people, since they use Telegram on their, yeah, it's the popular messaging app, for, especially for the younger generations, they started these, these, these groups uh, in, all, in all the countries where they moved. And in these groups, well, they shared a lot of uh, relevant information. They ask for help. Um, for instance, if they need uh, help with whatever, they ask other Ukrainians that who are in the same conditions, because obviously, I mean, I'm also a foreigner here, so I guess uh, foreigners here know that when you move to a different country, your, the community where you come from, it's usually a source of support. Right? So that's natural. People that speak your language. So that's what they did. They ask for help. They share information. They offer assistance to one another. If they can help with whatever they need, that's on these kind of platforms they, they offer help. So obviously, in these kind of gr groups, there is plenty of information that is really relevant for the, Red Cross, for the Red Cross to adapt the programs. So we came with our assessments about, uh, OK, they need shelter, they need food, they need cash. But maybe two or three months pass, and the needs of the affected people change because the context change, because everybody's going back to Ukraine. So now they need transportation, or they need uh, legal assistance because half of their family is moving uh, across borders. So then actually, the most relevant thing that we can do to help them is to provide legal assistance. So this is just an example, but this kind of uh, live information about the needs of people is really interesting for the Red Cross. We know what they tell us on our social media, but we don't know what's happening in all these different fora or places where they discuss. Obviously, it's hard to analyze at scale because these are many groups with many messages. So that's where we set up this service, social media listening. The idea is pretty simple. We can do it remotely as 510 to support many countries in Europe to analyze the needs of affected people as they're expressed in these Telegram uh, groups. And we can uh, give recommendations to the local Red Cross on how to adapt the program, so which actions to take to better fit with, uh, with what people are expressing. We do it in seven countries, so Ukraine and uh, many neighboring countries. So the whole thing will run for about three years. We started uh, about a year ago, um, and we do it for also for the next year as well. The team is a bit fluctuating because you know with emergencies we go. To, yeah. It's a bit of a mess, but more or less we always have one or two uh, tech people following the process, adapting new features, etc., and two or three more analysts. I will tell them what they do. Analysts, translators, people more like orient that, that, that interact with the local Red Crosses. I'm going to tell you the process in a bit. Just to give you an idea of the scale of, uh, of this thingy. So what do we do with Telegram? Well, uh, class, like, the pipeline is uh, not, nothing surprising. We start by collecting messaging, doing some data cleaning, and translating. Our analysts don't speak Ukrainian. We have a few Ukrainian colleagues, but obviously standardizing in English enables the team to work more collaboratively. We started simply using the default uh, Azure AI translator, whatever. But actually, more recently, there is a lot of also open source stuff of Hugging Face. I'm sure that you know if you're all uh, tech people in ML. Uh, one package that I can recommend is uh, from a UKP lab, EasyNMT. It's a nice thing. There is a wrapper around the most used uh, language models in Hugging Face. So you can call all of them basically with the same uh, interface, with the same uh, set of commands, which is nice because then you can pick and choose your language model depending on you know, what, you want, what you're translating from to. So it's a nice, uh, well, just a recommendation. Next step for data protection, we wanted to do something to reduce the amount of personal information in these messages. Even though these are public groups, uh, people you know, who are not so conscious about uh, personal information, they do share lots of personal information in these groups. And we don't want, by any means, to contribute to the misuse of this information. So what we do on top of these messages is to apply some anonymization, removal of personal identifiable information, names, phone numbers, addresses, etc. 
for this, actually, we didn't find anything, I mean, at least I didn't find anything that I was really particularly happy about, so we built something uh, custom. Uh, they call it the anonymization app, check out on our GitHub, which we basically combine some rule-based uh, heuristic for, you know, for numbers and stuff, it's just a regular expression. Uh, together we name it named entity recognition from whatever model you want to use. So combining the two at the end, you get, you get a pretty good uh, uh, yeah, uh, recall on the personal identifiable information. And finally, we store them uh, somewhere in an SQL database, and that's how we first get the message in a shape where we can analyze them. And uh, ah, everything, if you want, is just 100% Python, uh, dockerized, and we host it on a web API in Azure, just for the technicalities. Uh, and then we need to analyze the messages. For that, uh, obviously, uh, initially, we didn't, we had, we started, we didn't want to be too biased about how we want to analyze the message, specifically classify them. Uh, in order to, yeah, to do something with them. So we started by manual labeling. Uh, obviously at the beginning we didn't use Argilla, but then later we discovered this very nice data labeling platform. I don't know if you know that. Have you, who has heard about Argilla? Nobody. <laughs> then I'm about to blow your mind. I love Argilla. Um, that's a data labeling platform for specifically for text and uh, designed uh, especially for, line, for um, kind of uh, training procedures for large language models. So if anything is work, if anyone is working on fine tuning uh, LLMs, uh, that's definitely you want to check out Argilla. And then obviously we automate, after we have some labeled data, we automate the, the procedure by training a specific uh, uh, model. We use sentence transformers, which are simply small models that you can uh, uh, fine tune with set fit. I'm going to talk about set fit later, so I'm not going to spend time now. Uh, but you have a nice little model which is very well performing to classify messages. And you can do this uh, iteratively, so people label, validate the predictions, you retrain the model, etc. So it gets better and better. Um, what is nice about Agila is that it has a very nice, again, Python um, uh, client or, or or thingy that from to, with which you can put data in and out, get labels, get predictions, return the models, everything. Uh, yeah, with very, very few lines of code. So for this kind of workflows, humans in the loop of validation of predictions, it's a really nice uh, tool. At least I like it very much. It looks like this. It's uh, I don't know, it has some UI. You can filter messages by status, annotation, prediction, or whatever metadata you want to put. It gives you, uh, I don't know, prediction scores, and you can ask people to validate predictions, or you can ask people to validate data from scratch. Uh, it's open source. It's for free. You can uh, spin it up on a hugging face space. So you can start playing. Uh, you can have a demo in five seconds on a hugging face space, and you can test it with your team and see if it fits your purposes. So. I'm a big fan, and it actually it's helping us a lot to to speed us to speed up the process and really have this uh, yeah streamline the process. Now after we have uh, labeled some data, then obviously that's when when we fine tune our classifier. For this we use Setfit. Who? How many of you have heard of Setfit? Nobody. <laughs> Boom, set fit. So that's a framework for efficient uh, few shot learning of sentence transformers. So sentence transformers are simply, uh, so at the end of the day, they are embedders. People, they're models that take sentences and embed them in some vector space, which with that you can use. You can, once you have vectors, you can do whatever you want, uh, including classification. Um, so these embedders are usually trained by uh, minimizing the distance between sentences which are semantically similar and maximizing the distance between, between sentences that, are, that don't mean the same thing, right? So what you do with Setfit, if you have a couple of examples, you give them to, you first retrain the, the sentence transformer, so the embedder itself, with these pairs. You say, I have two, two, sent two messages labeled in the same way, so they are semantically similar. Therefore, you should give a low score to this, uh, to this, uh, to this thing. Yeah, yeah, this is after, no, this is all in English, huh? Um, at least I couldn't find any sentence with format that works in Ukrainian. And does it affect your um, So again, we don't, I, we didn't find a, uh, this, like a, a classifier that can work directly in Ukrainian, so I cannot give you a number. But we do have, we did have Ukrainian speakers validate their translations, <laughs> and they work okay. -ish. I miss some words, but uh, yeah, I don't have a number about the decrease of performance, but it's a generic problem. Eh? Um, 
So now you fine-tune uh, your embedder, then you use the embedded fine-tuner to recreate embeddings. So again, you pass the same examples again to the same uh, embedder, and then you retrain the last head, the classifier head. <laughs> like usually in these kind of models, you have an embedder, and on top of it, a classifier or whatever, a small last layer to f specifically for the task that you are interested in. So then you retrain the last layer as well, and at the end you have uh, your fully retrained classifier. It's nice set fit because it has shown that, well, it's, um, it's quite efficient. You don't need many examples. I'm going to show you later. Uh, but working with, uh, with, uh, with uh, sentence transformers, you don't need prompt engineering. So, well, I don't know how's your experience, but you know, it's always a bit uh, tricky. I don't think it's an exact science yet. So it's just, uh, it works more reliably. Uh, it is fa fast to train. You can work with smaller models. So these uh, sentence transformers, they're usually, you know, one gigabyte model, the top performing. So it's stuff that you don't need uh, big GPUs and money to run, which we at the Red Cross, we don't have. Um, and it can, they also have multilingual support. So they can, um, they can, there are a few models, not in Ukraine, unfortunately, but in many languages now they, you have uh, models that support them. To give you an idea of how efficient they are, just, uh, I don't know, the, you see as a number of, the number of samples that you provide to the model and the performance as F1 uh, on, uh, on this particular case, you see that you start from like 65% uh, F1 with four examples, and then with 20, 25 examples, whatever that is, you already get to a pretty good place. Again, we're not here to be accurate, um, but mostly to facilitate the analysis of, the, of these messages, which is the next step that we're going to show you. So for us, this kind of, per this kind of performance is, uh, is quite good already to first sort out the messages. Another thing that I like about SetFit, and please stop me if I'm running later. Huh? No. How am I doing with time? Okay. Another thing that I like about SetFit is that you can basically replace the sentence transformer with whatever you want. Now, this is a very is a rapidly evolving field. So the model that you choose nowadays, one year down the road, uh, is probably last in the leaderboard, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to have a workflow in which you want to replace uh, that part, which we don't develop custom models, but you want an easy way to quickly update in case a better model uh, comes out. Uh, you just want to put it there and retrain with what with everything that you had. And that's what SetFit enables, because sentence transformers, there are plenty of them on Hugging Face. Um, every month or so, there is a better one coming out. So you can quickly, you know what I mean? Stay, use the best performing model without changing everything of your, of your infrastructure, basically. Now, the last mile, this is actually very relevant for us, because um, at the end, we are a humanitarian organization. So we and also a, like a historical humanitarian organization. So the kind of end users that we have, the people that run programs um, where their emergencies happen are usually not the most digitally literate, okay? And, uh, but ultimately we want this to be useful for them. So obviously we started uh, like uh, good uh, data people by building a fancy dashboard that shows all the statistics about uh, you know, how you classify the messages, what are the trends, uh, what are the most relevant quotes, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, these dashboards are not really useful for people in the field. These people don't look, maybe they look at them once. Uh, you, present to, you present them to them, uh, uh, they like them, cool. But then if you call them back two weeks later, yeah, they don't do much. They don't, they don't like them. People that are not used to investigate data, to click, drill down, and filter, for them, a dashboard is fancy but useless. So this is, this is, but this, was really, this is really useful for the team, because then you can automate, for the team that analyzes the messages, you can do these, uh, these analyses quite quickly. So this we can do internally, but that's definitely not the solution for the, for the people that we want to support that actually take decisions on the programs of the Red Cross. So we had to go back and actually introduce the human touch. So our analysts get the output of all this complicated pipeline, and they sit down with the program people in the different uh, countries that we support, and we actually explain what we saw. We explain what we think we should do to adapt the programs, and we write it down in documents, which is what they are used to work with. So ultimately, you adapt uh, your information to the specific um, format that people are used to work with. And that's uh, ultimately what you need to even though it's time consuming and we like to automate everything, blah, blah, blah. At the end, it's what you need to, to make this information consumed and, 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 uh, and used. Uh, 
So at the end, they prepare these kind of reports, monthly reports for the whole European region that they are shared across all the Red Crosses in Europe, and uh, bi-weekly updates for the specific uh, countries uh, that, uh, that, we, that we analyze within this service. They sit with them and they explain what they saw, they explain what the recommended actions, and obviously there is a lot of uh, manual uh, work involved. Yeah. The process afterwards. You Again, reiterate the usage of the product? Yeah, it's... Um, Could you repeat the question? The question was, how do you evaluate how used and useful these reports are? Well, first of all, this is a continuous process, so we present them regularly, so we can directly evaluate with them how this is being perceived. And then at a regular time, we do uh, more deep uh, user research. I mean, again, it's not, uh, there's not a magic solution. Other than you go there, you, 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 you take some time with the people and say, look, uh, you know, we're running this service, we don't need to run it, is it useful for you? And we're not a company, we're not making money out of this, so ultimately what matters for us is that this is useful by people that run programs. So that's what we do, we go and we talk with them. And uh, if it's not, we adapt. And uh, that's, that's how we settle to this uh, process, basically. The reason why they want this is that they print it and they go around to the, to the management and show them, ah, oh, nice, there's a logo, nice, um, <laughs> looks professional. So <laughs> that's it, we don't track. People, thank you. Uh, people tell us they're useful. Um, and actually, no, we, we do actually more detailed user research. Like we, we really try to, na to narrow down what, is, what are the specific decision-making points that were influenced by this. And we got quite a few by now. So we have a few success stories. I can point you to more comms material uh, if you want to know. But no, people appreciate the service. Give you an idea, again, uh, big numbers. Um, we have about more than 50 groups on Telegram that we monitor, more than a million messages. Of these, uh, about 10%, uh, more than 10% we actually read, so that's the manual work that went in with the analysts uh, and the classification and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and we produced uh, many reports that we presented uh, many times to the different Red Crosses. So the last part, um, and I want to stress it, it's, uh, it was crucial for this to be useful, besides the technology. Regarding next steps, um, so we're going to continue supporting with this project until the end of 2024. Um, but obviously we want to work to make it more reusable. We want to this to be something that we can quickly spin up, deliver as a service, or even better, that a local Red Cross can use autonomously. Obviously, we're not quite there yet. We need to work to make it easily to redeploy if you want to deploy it on your own infrastructure. We, yeah, we don't really have, we're not really quite there. CICD, versioning, testing, uh, again, in case we want to really turn this into a product, so something that we maintain new features and release. And user documentation, obviously, with this I mean more the technical documentation, in case there is another data person, maybe not super technical from the other end, that wants to change something, we want to provide them some basic documentation. And obviously, in case we want to use this for a new emergency, we want to skip the, the, the very first part was about uh, defining the, the classification scheme, defining the labeling scheme, and starting labeling messages. Next time, we want to be faster, so we're actually exploring how we can, you know, uh, use things like topic modeling, so uh, more like unsupervised approaches to suggest a classification scheme that we can start using to classify messages, and then we adapt more iteratively. So we don't need to make a big exercise at the beginning to understand what is the classification scheme that makes more sense. If it makes sense. Um, that's about it. Check out what we do on GitHub and on LinkedIn. And if you want to help us uh, build things like this, talk, talk with Liz. Is she over there? Hi, Liz. So. Thank you, everybody. I want to first of all thank Jacopo. Uh, I actually found him on his GitHub that he just posted. 
started talking to him. Um, I work at Doctors Without Borders. We're a bit different than what the 510 initiative is doing. Uh, we're a lot smaller. We have about five, six people in our team, and we do everything from cloud engineering to data to AI. Uh, we do the whole front to back. And I hope today to show you one of those products. Um, and yeah, uh, sorry for catfishing you all. Uh, the picture that you saw, that was me five years ago. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm not a very great presenter, but I hope to entertain you. What I'll be talking about is uh, who we are and the chat, MSF chat UI that we built. I'll show you a demo. I'll talk a little bit about the tech part. I'll talk a bit about what will this cost if you're thinking of implementing this in your company. And I will show you some of the other artificial intelligence projects that we've done, but very short snapshots of it. So who are we? Well, we're actually uh, a little mixed team. Uh, we are a couple of people who really enjoy working with data and AI. And most of us are in the New York office and two of us in the Amsterdam office. We have a DevOps engineer, a data engineer, a data engineer, a software engineer, and a data and cloud engineer. But basically, this guy and this guy is what who made the product that you will see right now. Um, so, well, the motivation of why we did this project is actually, well, one of these articles that I think everybody in this room probably has read, which is the article that was written by uh, the Harvard Business School. Basically, what they did is they gave ChatGPT to these Boston consulting groups, and then they had a control group, and they basically did the exact same 18 tasks. And what they realized, they completed a 12% more tasks on average, 25% more quickly, and 40% of higher quality. And we thought, holy shit, our company hasn't even heard of ChatGPT. Nobody in MSF actually knows what ChatGPT is. And I think many other companies might have the same thing. So we thought, OK, how could we unleash this? But the first biggest problem that we had, of course, was how do we make sure that people use ChatGPT in a dependable and secure manner? The biggest issue is most people immediately go to the free version. They immediately understand that it's under standard privacy policy, so whatever you put in there obviously will be used to retrain the LLM for the next version. Another issue is that some of you probably have already seen is availability issues. There are usage spikes. You get kicked out if you have the free version. If you have the pay version, you probably won't, but who's everyone who's going to pay for it? Another one is, of course, the newer models that come out, GPT-4 and GPT-4-32K, which are a lot longer context windows, are not generally available. Now there's actually 128K. Again, you kind of, if you're using the free version, you kind of get stuck, and there's strict rate limits, the amount of prompts you can do. And another big issue is customization. So user interface cannot be customized. Uh, and in external integrations uh, are usually managed by OpenAI, and content moderation is also. But then I guess you guys are all saying right now, well, Derek, why don't you guys just use the enterprise version of ChatGPT? And that's because I don't know if any of you guys have spoken to OpenAI, but it's really expensive. Um, they basically say you need a minimum of 150 licenses. Uh, it's about $60 per user starting off, and then 20 once you start having more, your typical business model. It's not pay per use, so actually when you have these 150 people, you don't actually know if 150 people are all using it. Who are you gonna give these licenses out? It's quite dramatic to unleash that into your company. And we are Doctors Without Borders, we can't spend that money. We just don't have it, who are we gonna give it to? And the contract management and effort that is involved. And again, enterprise, you don't really have a lot of the customizations available. So what did we do? We built our own internal MSF chat UI with, in the back end, Azure OpenAI, so that we do have all the standard um, security features, which is the prompts that people will put in, because you can imagine that Doctors Without Borders has a lot of confidential information, a lot of people asking medical questions maybe, or very highly sensitive information. We don't want to put that into a free version. Not everybody can afford the 25 euros, but we do want to give them it. So we use Azure OpenAI, which basically says, your data won't be used. Um, obviously, that's a trust thing you and Microsoft need to make, but most of our data is already in SharePoint, is in Outlook and everything, so we spoke for Microsoft, so why wouldn't we trust Azure OpenAI? So how does this look like? So we have uh, ai.msf.org, which has uh, your, your standard, obviously, Active Directory integration. 
But uh, basically, it's the same thing as most chat UIs that you've seen, except there's a couple of features because we really want to teach the people how to use ChatGPT in a bit more of a different way. We obviously have your standard, which model do you want to use? But there's another feature which allows you to import and export existing prompts. So imagine people that are not as uh, uh, well known with ChatGPT, but they do want to start seeing the, the, the functionalities of ChatGPT. We can basically have these kind of like demo prompts. So for example, here you can type in demo. And this is, for example, a prompt for a job description. For example, here I'm saying job title. Uh, I want to be a data engineer. I want it to be in the IT department. And the requirements need to be Python, la, 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 la. Basically, it just immediately auto-generates the prompts. We have many other types of prompts as well. It's just very similar. Well, that's unfortunate. A demo always going wrong. Is that my internet? Yeah, so, well, there it goes. It was still loading. But basically, you can create these customer prompts with like also how we do our MSF styled job descriptions or letters. But it was basically more to show that we go to each of these departments. We show them these standard prompts. We show them how to use this chat UI just to get people who are maybe not technically as avid as we are to understand how this can help with your workflows. Then we show people how they can export these prompts, how they can share these prompts, and how they can really improve their workflows. Everybody has experienced ChatGPT probably in this room, but the majority of people in a company haven't. And it's really cool to see what actually people who don't have experience with ChatGPT, what kind of prompts they come up with. These custom prompts, we also have many different types of prompts. So we build a lot of sets to demo. But yeah, that's just basically what it is. Now I'll go to how we actually did this and also a bit about the limitations. Um, so that was the demo. Well. There are some limitations to this model uh, comparatively to the other thing, which is one is that it's locally stored. So your chat history that you normally have in ChatGPT, you can't bring across devices. It's locally cached. Another one is the prompt session. So you know how you interact with ChatGPT and it learns from what you've said before. It's actually all used in one session because it's kind of state, it's statelessness and it retreats that whole chat history as one request which basically means you quickly hit token limits if you have long conversations with this ChatGPT, which you don't tend to do in the paid version. Another one is the maintainability. I'm going to show you a bit how we maintain it, how we deploy it, how we develop it. Um, well, you kind of need different skills in the team. So that's kind of where that weird title that came in that you saw earlier that you're like, why does Derek do so many things? I hope to kind of explain that now. So technical overview, what do we use? Uh, well, we use everything Azure. Oh, sorry, Azure Cloud resources. So we use Azure OpenAI. We use log analytics. We use Kubernetes and their nodes. We have many networking components. We have API management in the back end to uh, regulate when keys are and token limits are hit. So we can use different keys. Uh, we use apps and identities in the back end to talk to the different key vaults where these tokens are found. And of course, we have the key vaults itself. Uh, the different DevOps practices that we do in our team. Everything is Terraform. Uh, everything is deployed through Azure DevOps. Uh, and we use Docker applications, uh, for, uh, Docker applications to host the images. Sorry, I'm not. Um, and the programming languages that are very used for this are just Bash, PowerShell, and the whole web application is in JavaScript, and particularly in Next.js. So actually, it's quite simple. We actually only have real three real pipelines. Um, we have AI infrastructure, which deploys all of our infrastructure uh, so that it's also maintainable and scalable. We can also start deploying it to other sections. So maybe, yeah, I should have probably started that. We're just Amsterdam, operational hub Amsterdam. So we represent about 12,000 people of Doctors Without Borders. But we also have Brussels. We also have Geneva. We also have Barcelona. We have Paris, and basically our idea is that we're going to use this solution and basically be able to deploy it in all these other sections, that they'll get their own billing, but that everything that we build with our AI team becomes deployable in any other place in our movement. Um, so the first pipeline is, well, we built all these resources in Terraform. I mean, I think you guys probably know what most of the, what that is. It's not very interesting. Um, but the more interesting is this chatbot UI that you actually saw is actually open source. Uh, it's actually built by someone at uh, Microsoft. 
Uh, Shane, great dude, uh, spoke to him a couple of times about it and what his plans are for it. Um, but obviously that's not enough. So what he did, he actually has a great article if you want to learn how to deploy this yourself or kind of show this off to your company or if you want to do it yourself. It's very easy. There's a blog post. Basically, they're using front doors and container registries and Azure Container Apps. And I think what, out of experience, it takes about half a day to deploy if you're a bit more comfortable with Azure and you're a bit comfortable with how to navigate these resources. Uh, I know someone in this room has also done it in half a day. Shout out to Nick. Um, but actually, the big problem with this, this does not scale well. Um, and that the main reason for this is that Azure Container Apps, so what they're using in this original deployment, is really used for small-scale deployments for just some couple containerized applications. I believe you guys use it, right? It's great for low context, but once you start having many, many users, which is our hope or goal, that we actually have thousands of people using it, it becomes quite a pain to manage. So we switch to Kubernetes clusters. Um, we basically redeploy this whole solution start re-hosting it, build up new DevOps and CI CD pipelines here so that we can actually have more insight into the resource utilization, also to help with a bit of the load balancing amongst the nodes. Uh, and we're looking at creating some more health metrics because eventually my hope and goal, and that's also my hope and goal of the team, is that we can just make MSF 1% more productive with these tools. And considering we're 60,000 people with a technology like this, if we can make them 1% more productive, we've created 600 fictive of jobs. That's kind of what we joke about in our team. But yeah, we want to scale this. We really want to make it big. So this guy, choose this if you really want to scale and you're working in a large enterprise. So all you would then need to do is re-engineer a bit what has been happening. You need to create some YAML pipelines to do a Docker push and for the cluster deployments, and you're off to go. One other thing that we also built on top of it is we added uh, extra pages for single sign-on. So that's what you saw, just so that we can close it off with Active Directory and also so that we can do some of the management and see who are using what tokens and how much is being consumed across specific users to also kind of see for later to target specific individuals, what are you using it for and to have more focus groups to understand how people are using ChatGPT in our organization. So now the real question for people who like money, how much is this gonna cost you? It's actually quite cheap. Um, what I was telling you earlier is that, yeah, it's about $60 per user. We're running about now only with a very small sample size of 30 users because we're not allowed to give it to everyone yet because I think like most companies, we haven't really determined whether we're gonna accept or deny AI in our company. But we think with the amount of compute that we have and with the load balancing that we can hit up about 200 users. And I think the tokens usage is very, very low. It's about $1 to $2 uh, per person uh, per month. So obviously, as you can see, the basic infrastructure will cost you maybe a bit. But as you start scaling, you have more and more users. And we might have three, four, five hundred 500 users. I don't think it will cost us more than $2,000 to host this whole solution. All you need is some control plane, some nodes, some bastion service, some jump boxes to kind of see, and some firewall services, API management, and some Azure OpenAI. So it's not that expensive. Uh, that's kind of what this slide is supposed to tell you. Um, but that's not the only thing we've done. We're, we're experimenting a lot. Uh, we're still waiting to get approval to actually deploy any of these things in production, just making sure the camera sees that as well before my manager hears this. None of this is actually live besides this ai.msf.org, except it's very limited to the users. It's behind security groups, so only 30, 40 people can access it. But we've also done a lot of other things. We've done things with Azure with speech to text. So we have a lot of testimonies from refugees coming in. Uh, we've done speech to text on sample data. It's actually quite good when you're using Azure, Cog Azure speech services. Another one that I really think is cool is we've done something with media monitoring. There's this API called GDELT, which basically allows you to scrape hundreds of thousands of news articles each week. Uh, and with Python, we can filter them out and we start doing a bit of prompt engineering to summarize these news articles and to send out automated newsletters about localized news in these countries. We've done a lot of on search, which is just scraping a lot of documents uh, with Azure Cognitive Search to kind of inventorize and summarize some of the research that we have done. 
We have two machine learning projects going on as well. We have a malaria anticipation project that is in its second phase right now, which where we're trying to predict uh, malaria outbreaks in very contextual environments in South Sudan. And we're doing now one also with Iraq, trying to classify patients on their need of care. Another one that I'm quite excited about, but we probably not sure if we're allowed to use it, is Health Insights, so Google MedPalm. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but MedPalm is a, a pretty revolutionary LLM that we want to test out and see how we can use that. And we also want to start testing out vision. So we've done a couple of proof of concepts, like how can we take field notes or whatever and kind of translate that into real data and start pushing it to our data warehouse or start analyzing it in a different way. Damn, my mouth is dry. Um, that is it. Thank you so much. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>